Right now I'm standing in the middle of our mineral reference collection and this is one of three collections that we have here in our larger Department of Mineral Sciences. Um, in addition to the mineral collection, which the gem collection is part of, we also have our meteorite collection and we have a rock and ore collection. And being a natural history museum, our department is the part of the museum that deals with the hard, non-living part of the earth, the rocks, the minerals, anything that's not a plant or an animal pretty much ends up in our department. But the broader museum has science departments and all these other areas of research. So we have, it seems like, endless numbers of biology departments. We have paleobiology, anthropology, all these other areas of research going on. And we're kind of this small little oasis of, of mineral sciences here in this large sea of biology. But uh, on the other hand, since the Earth is mostly made up of rock, we understand the importance of our role here. So this is the mineral reference collection. We have in this room, which you can see extends for quite a ways, about 375,000 mineral specimens from around the world. And the purpose of this collection primarily is to support scientific research. And so if we open a couple drawers here, just to give you an idea of what is in this room. So each of these drawers are filled with mineral specimens from around the world. The minerals are arranged according to the Dana system, which is a system based on composition. So all of the similar kinds of minerals are going to be together in one place. So for scientists coming in, they can find most of the things they're interested in in all one part of the collection. So for example, this is quartz. And within the quartz drawers, um, we have them arranged alphabetically by locality. So we have everything from you know, Arkansas to Brazil to Japan. Here I'm in the M, so I've got some from Madagascar and Maine. And so these are specimens that are used, again, primarily by research scientists. Now, each of the specimens gets a number on it. And so, for example, we've got a number here. That is keyed to a computerized database. We can then go and look up all the information we have about that specimen. Also allows us to keep track of where it is. But if a researcher comes in and is interested in studying this specimen, then we typically take just a little chip off of this. We call it a chip to be consumed and we send that with the researcher. What we ask in return is that they share with us any data that they've acquired or papers they've published so we can add that back to our database and make it um, more valuable and more useful for other scientists. Essentially, any scientist in the world has access to this collection. Typically, nowadays, most of them will contact me by email with a brief description of their research project. And as long as they're connected to a legitimate research organization, we will try to find specimens in the collection that will fit for their particular research needs. Ultimately, the value of this collection, really, is to the overwhelming scientific community of the world because this is a collection that is one of the largest of its kind in the world and we truly believe will essentially be here forever. And also being the Smithsonian, being our national collection, it's always going to be accessible to researchers. And that means a specimen like this being studied today will still be around here tens of years, hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years from now. So scientists can always come back, restudy the same specimen, look at it. So it becomes kind of the standard mineral collection for the scientific community. And so it's this long-term accessibility to the scientific community that really makes this collection as valuable as it is.